Hello, friends, and welcome to Sleep Tight Stories. Red and the other girls have solved the playground mystery and think that Mr. McCaskill probably arranged the whole thing to get them to give credit to the custodian, Mr. LeClaire. Once Red is home, she eats dinner and talks about her day before heading up to her room to relax with some university-level science books. Red remembers that she needs to take Dr. Hart's box back to school the next day, so she gets it out from under her bed. Seeing the box again brings back that uneasy feeling that she thinks there is more here than she can see. The Transfer Student, Part 26 Red walked through the front door and waved at Alexa, who sped off in the taxi they had booked to get home from school. For some reason, on Earth, you always waved with an open palm when coming and going. It had taken Red a long time to figure out why people kept raising their hands at her, which she knew made them think she was unfriendly. And in truth, she kind of was at first. When she first arrived, she didn't really want to be around anyone. But over time, even Red needed friends to hang out with. Her feet squished uncomfortably as she stepped inside, the sound of her soaked shoes echoing in the quiet entryway. A wonderful aroma drifted from the kitchen. Sweet vanilla mixed with a root vegetable she couldn't quite identify. Her stomach growled in response, triggered by the scent. After kicking off her shoes, Red peeled off her damp socks, wrinkling her nose at the far less pleasant smell. Yuck, she thought. Red, is that you? Her mother called from the kitchen. We're just sitting down for dinner. Hurry and join us before it gets cold. You know we don't eat cold food here on Earth. We don't do a lot of things on Earth, Red muttered under her breath. Coming, Mom, she called out louder, draping her wet socks over the stair banister. It was kind of gross, but... Her hunger was more pressing at the moment. As she entered the kitchen, Blue immediately stuck his tongue out at her, mid-shoe no less, giving her a preview of their dinner. Roasted beans, root vegetables, and waffles. Red loved the waffles, didn't mind the vegetables, but could do without the beans. Grabbing a bowl, she sat down, ignoring the gross noise Blue made as she did. She wasn't interested in a fight tonight. So, tell me about your day, her mother said. How did the mystery activity go? She's probably failing math and just hanging out with those weird kids, Blue grumbled, always eager to stir up trouble. He was better at math than Red had been at his age, but the idea of her failing math on Earth was ridiculous. He was just trying to get a rise out of her. Red ignored him. Classes are the same as always. I'm not sure it even qualifies as a review, it's so easy. English is as weird as ever, and Mr. McCaskill never lets up. He's always calling on me to make sure I'm paying attention when I'd rather daydream about hanging out with my friends at the commons back on Mars. Well, that sounds like he's a good teacher, her mother replied. It took me a while to focus in class when I first started learning. That's ancient history, Blue chimed in with a smirk. That must have been at least 200 years ago. 
Red smiled at Blue's joke, a rare occurrence. It's only been a hundred years, thank you very much, their mother replied, pretending to be offended. Anyway, how did your after-school activity go? Did you solve the mystery? Yeah, we solved it. I think Mr. McCaskill set it up from the beginning. He probably knew the answer all along. It was Mr. LeClaire, the custodian. He's been taking apart the playground equipment to clean and repair it, but he wanted to keep it a secret. I guess he does a lot of work around the school without getting much appreciation, and Mr. McCaskill wanted to change that without just announcing it. Weird, right? I still don't understand why anyone needs playground equipment anyway. Because it's fun, Blue interrupted. Everything on Mars was so boring. Here we can climb like monkeys and run around. You look like a monkey, Red shot back, irritated by his interruption. You smell like one, Blue retorted with a grin. Okay, okay, let's calm down their mother interjected. Finish your dinner, Blue, and put your dishes in the cleaning box by the sink. It's called a dishes washer, Mom, Blue corrected, rolling his eyes. Their mother sighed, shaking her head. I'm glad you helped solve the mystery, Red. You should think about signing up for some upper-level courses. You could take those online, and no one would know you're studying at that level. I'll think about it, Red said, pouring more maple syrup, the most delicious liquid Earth had to offer, onto her waffles. After finishing dinner and putting her bowl in the dishwasher, something even Blue had trouble remembering the name of, Red headed upstairs. She planned to relax with some university-level science textbooks before bed. But then she remembered, right, I should bring the box to Alexa tomorrow. She pulled the old rusted metal box from under her bed and set it aside so she wouldn't forget. That strange, uneasy feeling came over her again, the same one she had every time she looked at the contents. There's something more here, she thought. Unable to resist, Red opened the box again just to take one last look. She and her mother had dismissed its contents as oddities or curiosities, but that nagging feeling in the back of her mind had never gone away. She pulled out the photographs first. The one on top was the familiar faded picture of Dr. Hart standing beside her telescope, gazing toward the night sky. The inscription on the back read, First Contact. But aside from that, nothing about the image seemed particularly unusual. Most of the other photos were similar. Dr. Hart posing with her telescope or other equipment. Ordinary enough, considering the time period. Except... Wait a minute. Why didn't I think of this before? She muttered to herself. These photos were from the 1920s, long before self-timers were a common feature on cameras. She quickly grabbed her computer, searching for information about cameras from that time. As she suspected, the most affordable and popular cameras didn't have a built-in timer. So, who was taking these pictures? Red examined Dr. Hart's face in the photos more closely. Her eyes weren't focused on the camera lens, but seemed to be looking beyond it, at a person. Dr. Hart wasn't alone when these photos were taken. But who could have been there with her? Dr. Hart wasn't known to have been married, and there was no mention of an assistant or partner 
in any of the historical records. Flipping through the stack of photos, Red noticed something odd. One photo was stuck to the back of another. Carefully peeling them apart, she found an image she hadn't seen before. It was of Dr. Hart standing with someone else, someone younger, who looked vaguely familiar. Red squinted, her sharp Martian vision straining to make out the details. Is that my mother? Or could it be my father? The photo was faded and Red couldn't be sure. Am I just imagining things? The resemblance was unsettling. Feeling flustered, she set the photo on her desk and reached for the stone. The stone had been a puzzle to her from the beginning. It felt like an ordinary rock, no different from those she'd seen on Earth or Mars. This time, though, she decided to focus on it more carefully. She rubbed it between her fingers, turned it over in her hand, and even smelled it. Nothing about it seemed out of the ordinary, just another stone. But then again, Red thought, people make a big deal about rare stones on Earth, like diamonds or jade. Maybe it had some hidden significance. As she absentmindedly rubbed the stone, she noticed something strange, almost imperceptible at first. The color of the stone was starting to change. She blinked, staring more closely. Was it reacting to her touch? To the heat of her hand? She rubbed it harder, and the stone gradually became translucent, almost as if it was vanishing right before her eyes. Red could feel her heart racing. Certainly no stone on Earth or Mars behaved like this. She stared at the now almost invisible object in her palm. What is this thing? This changes everything, Red thought as she reached into the box, her fingers brushing against the documents inside. Unless I'm going crazy, this box contains far more than the ramblings of an eccentric scientist. As she fumbled with the papers, something caught her attention. A small, barely noticeable bump along the side of the box. Imperfections weren't surprising in an old box like this, especially with its worn state. None of the gang had bothered to feel along the inside before. They had assumed it was just an ordinary, albeit curious-looking container. Red studied the box more closely. It was made of an unusual material. Though rusted, which meant the presence of iron, the surface felt smoother than anything of this era should. Running her fingers along the seams, she felt the bump again, this time more deliberately. Could there be more to this box than we thought? She pressed against the bump gently, curious about what might happen. I don't want to break it. Alexa would be upset if I did, she muttered. After fiddling with it for a few moments, she pressed harder, and suddenly, a soft click echoed from within. The side of the box popped open, as if it had some kind of pressure release mechanism. Inside was something unexpected, a necklace with a small charm attached. The charm was sleek, thin, and looked almost pristine despite the age of the box. No, it can't be, Red thought. 
She had never seen one in person, but had heard of devices like this. Back on Mars, they were used as homing beacons by those venturing beyond the safety of the habitats or even outside the planet itself. Could this be one of those devices? She stared at the delicate charm, her fingers trembling slightly as she turned it over. Red's mind swirled with questions. Why would Dr. Hart hide something so valuable in a box she seemed to want someone to find? Could my mother or father be connected to this? Red looked at the photograph again. Dr. Hart standing beside someone who looked so familiar. Was it my father or my mother? Martians lived much longer than Earthlings, making it entirely possible that either of her parents could have been on Earth long before she ever imagined. But if that were true, why had they never mentioned Dr. Hart? And why would this homing device, something so rare and important, be hidden in a compartment no one would have noticed? It doesn't make sense, Red thought, a knot tightening in her stomach. Dr. Hart clearly wanted someone to find the box. Otherwise, why leave so many clues? But if Dr. Hart had been in contact with Martians, did that mean Red's parents had been involved? Or worse, did they know more than they had ever told her? Each new piece of the puzzle only made things more complicated. Red felt as though the ground beneath her was shifting, leaving her unsure who to trust, even within her family. Suddenly, a knock at her door startled her. Go away, Blue. I'm busy. Red, it's Mother. Her mother's voice was soft but firm. I just thought I'd check on you before I went to bed. May I come in? Without waiting for a reply, she slowly opened the door. Mom, Red protested. Usually when you ask to come in, you wait for an answer. But she knew this was how her mother had always been. Privacy hadn't been a priority when they lived on Mars. Having this much space to herself was one of the few benefits of living on Earth. Her mother stepped into the room, her eyes scanning Red's desk. The moment she saw what was in Red's hand, her face drained of color. Her usually composed expression faltered. Where did you find that? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. The charm suddenly felt heavier in Red's hand. What is it, Mom? Red asked, audibly upset. What aren't you telling me? Her mother hesitated, the silence thick between them. Then, in a voice Red had never heard before, her mother said, There's something you need to know about your father and Dr. Hart. And that is the end of this part. Good night. Sleep tight. <laughs>